Welcome back to another UFC fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the full card of fights for UFC 257 Poirier versus McGregor 2. So without further ado, let's get to our first fight on the card and our first fight of the night. So in our first fight, we have in the flyweight division, Amir Albazi versus Zalgis Zulmagalov. And this is a fight I predicted before, and I'm sticking with it. I'm pre predicting Al Bazi to win. I think um, Zumagalov is a fighter that's not that, that great, but he's a fighter that's just tough, difficult, and annoying to fight. Not the best striking. He has a very durable chin, very hard, ugly face, hard chin. He has good wrestling takedown defense. So if you you just like lacking in any area, like say you're just trying to lay on him, that's not going to be work. Or you're just trying to knock him out and you're going to gas, that's not going to work. So he could cause a lot of issues. He could go fire rounds. He could be tough. He could be difficult. But he's not like an excellent striker, in my opinion. Not an excellent offensive wrestler. But like I said, defensively, offensively, all right. Defensively, pretty solid. Like I said, he's a tough fighter to deal with, but not the most amazing fighter, in my opinion. I think Al-Bazi is just a more technical fighter, faster, sharper, a little bit longer, a little bit taller. And in a three-round fight, I think Al-Bazi can outstrike him, outwork him, and beat him. I, think, I don't think it's going to be a pretty easy fight, but... It's going to be a tough competitive fight, but I think Al-Bazi is a sharper, more technical fighter. In a three-round fight, it'll serve him better to get a decision in this one. So, in this one, I have Amir Al-Bazi via decision. Now to our next fight, we have a catchweight bout at 150, Mavzar Evlev versus Nick Lentz. So, we're really looking at this one right here. Um, Nick Lentz is a veteran of the game, daily guillotine, improving striking, always been a solid wrestler. But let's look at this one right here. Evlev... I think he's a better wrestler. I think he's a better striker. I think he's faster. I think he's sharper. Better kicks, better punches. Good counter wrestling, good submission defense. And it's all around. I don't think Nitlins can really pose any much threat to him. I think he could be a competitive fight for him. But I think all the threats are presented on Everlev. So I think he can put, potentially put Nick Lentz away, potentially. I don't really think he has the most success offensively wrestling Lentz. I think more so he can use his wrestling in defense and just use the distance and pick apart Lentz, an aggressive Lentz, trying to like load up and land big shots and try to initiate grappling. I just think he likes it. Maintains that distance, picks him apart, busts him up, and beats him to a decision. So, in this fight, I have Mavsar Evelev via decision. Now, to our next fight, we have in the middleweight division, Andrew Sanchez versus Mahmoud Moradov. And look at this one right here. You got a fight where I think Moradov is definitely the better, or nah, I won't even say, is he the better wrestler, grappler, Maybe by a small margin, maybe. As a matter of fact, I don't say it might be by a small margin, but by a relevant margin, I think Mac Murdov is just the overall the better fighter, and I think it's pretty clear. I think he's fast, I think he's sharper, much better boxer, definitely much better defense, definitely much better footwork. So I think this fight where Murdov will probably likely keep it on the feet, maybe mixing the takedown just to mix it in. I think Sanchez is going to be more so the one looking, trying to get for takedowns, but, definitely out of, but when he's going to be... More so looking for takedowns out of desperation or a need to get takedowns. I think they're going to get stuffed. Just going to end up him getting worn out from trying to assert himself to get these takedowns that he doesn't get. And the more of it, I was going to be the stick, move, and angle and just pick him apart on the feet. And I think he stops him in the third round early on. So in this fight, I have Mahmoud Moradov via third round TKO. Now to our next fight, we have in the light heavyweight division, Khalil Roundtree Jr. versus Marcin Pratchino. Or Pratchneo. And look at this one right here. Um, it's all it says Khalil Roundtree via first round knockout all written all over it. But one thing I'm gonna say is that Khalil Roundtree is not a, a safe bet, or he's not a guy that you can rely on. He's up and down, up and down, 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 up, up, down. Well, not up, up. He's I don't think he's ever been up, up. He's like down, down, up, up, down, up, down. That's the type of fighter he's I'm not saying as far as his winning and losing, he's very inconsistent. And has lost some very look very mediocre in some fights as far as IQ and grappling wise, even striking at times. But um, cardio wise too. So um, we're going against Prash Neal. Prash Neal is a is a fighter that just seems like he has zero fight IQ. Just look at the Sam Alvey fight. That's all you need to look at. Literally just walking with his hands down into punching range versus a heavy handed fighter. Multiple times get dropped, get right back up, and keep walking like his controller broke. But Prash Neal got the IQ of a roach. Even less matter of fact, Roach's got better better self preservation than him. But either way, of a dodo, that's probably better. But um, that's really what it comes down to. Prash Neo, I don't really see him mixing any grappling. He's gonna strike, and he's not like I say his fight IQ is that of a dodo. So he's gonna be like a lamp to slider, and round two he's gonna knock him on the first round. That's all I say. You got a guy that has all that power, pretty solid striking, and you're not gonna mix in any grappling. So he, you're gonna get knocked out first round. So in this fight, I have Khalil Roundtree Jr. via first round TKO. Now on to our next fight, we have in the women's bantamweight division, 
Juliana Pena or Pena versus Sarah McMahon. Look at this fight, right? You got two solid grapplers. McMahon is definitely the more experienced wrestler, definitely the more touted wrestler, the decorated wrestler. And I think she is the better wrestler, definitely. Striking wise, McMahon packs more power, but I think Pena is the better striker, in my opinion. I think overall grappling, Pena is the better grappling, especially when you see McMahon getting submitted by ch literal children in grappling events. I think that's just show humility. I guess you got to try to, you know, get better however you can, even if you suffer some embarrassing losses. It's all about the end picture, not, oh, the fact she lost to some child in grappling is the fact that she's trying to work an area where she needs improvement, but, and that was some years ago, but either way. In this one, I think it really comes down to the fact that like, I think McMahon would be the, the better wrestler, definitely is the better wrestler. But really in this one, I think Pena has more dog in her and she's younger. That's what it all comes down to. Like McMahon might be have heavy success with wrestling early on, but I think Pena is able to rally, push further, push a higher pace, and grind out hard. I think McMahon's either 40 or pushing 40. And even when you look at early career, like when in these dog fights, she, she usually losing. Like she... Um, Misha Tate was able to grind out a dog fight against her. She broke Misha Tate's jaw or eye or something, fractured something, orbital or something. But Misha Tate was able to out grind her. Like, McMahon, maybe with the lower end fighters, when she could just take them down and lay on them the whole time, she could beat them. But when the fighters are, you know, giving her, wrestling her back and pushing her back, like really pushing her back, and I'll be able to stuff her takedowns or like get some takedowns on her himself. Pretty much every single fight like that, she lost. Like she's not like she hasn't really been known to be that grit grind fighter. Like in a fight that's really, really back and forth, and she can't rely on the takedown, just lay on people for like two minutes and edge a decision. She loses that fight. And I think Pena is a fighter where Pena can be offensive off her back, score a takedown to McMahon, and take it to the later round, land strikes on McMahon on the feet, and make her real uncomfortable. And especially after that first round, really push it and give it to her and ground out a decision over McMahon. So in this fight, I have Juliana Pena via decision now to our cold prelim headliner we have in the middleweight division brad tavares versus antonio carlos jr and um this one is kind of straightforward i think carlos jr has shown to be a very dangerous fight on the ground some pretty decent striking as well some decent power not the best cardio notable to fade especially when he can't get the takedowns or when he tries you know isn't able to get a submission or get the finish like he wants and against brad tavares I think he can't really have the best success against Brad Tavares on taking him down or holding him down. And on the feet, I think Brad Tavares is, has packed more power as a cleaner, much cleaner, much technical, more technical striker. And also, he can push three rounds or push five rounds if needed. I don't know if he ever... Well, he has been in a five-round fight, but for the most part... I mean, yeah, I say he has been in a five-round fight against Adesanya and I think at least one other one. But his cardio is not an issue. Junior's cardio is an issue. And Junior, I think this one going to rely heavily on getting a takedown or what... Need to rely heavily on the takedown submission. But I don't think he's going to have that success and on the feet. I think Tavares can either put him away early or beat him to a decision or put him away late. I don't, and I think it's going to be more so like a decision type victory. Like he's going to be the um, wear down junior, take him late, and then just literally um, just pick him apart and weather him out and beat him to a decision. So in this fight, I have Brad Tavares via decision. Now to our prelim headliner we have in the lightweight division. Nasrat Hakparas versus Arman Suya Sur Surukian. And yeah, Suyakarin. I'm gonna say Suyakarin. Or yeah, Suyakarin. But um, yeah. Sorry about that one. But um against Hasparat versus Suyakarin. I see this one right here. I'm gonna be kind of very broad with it, but um strike it like hand wise as far as like boxing, fist punches, Hakparaz. Wrestling, grappling, Suyakarin. Kicks, Suyakarin. Overall, Suyakarin. So, I'm picking Siakarin to win. And I think um, Hakkarov's got the power in his hands, but defense definitely needs a little bit of work. Some, a little bit of patching. Forward needs a little bit of patching. Head movement needs a little bit of patching. But I really just think this comes down to the fact that um, like, they're both well-rounded fighters, but I just think Siakarin is better in more in most areas and better overall and better in the relevant areas. And I think he could push a higher pace than Hakkarov's. I think with his kicks, he can neutralize a lot of the boxing of Hakkarov's and the punching of Hakkarov's. And I said, mixing the takedowns and and just outwork him. Use all his full skill set, push a higher pace, and just outwork and outgrind Hawk Ross in a battle between two highly touted prospects. But I think this fight has Suyakarin written all over, and I think he's able to grind out a decision over Hawk Ross. Does it, do I think it's um, non competitive? No. Do I think it's super competitive? No. I think it's a decently competitive fight, but 
Suyaka ran fully in driver's seat the whole time. I think Hawker Price might, I don't matter of fact, I think it'll be a 30 27 shutout with Hawker Price being competitive in every round, but it being clear that Suyaka ran scoring the takedowns, landing more strikes, controlling the distance, controlling the strike, controlling the pace, and winning this one via decision. So in this fight, I have Armand Suyaka ran via decision. Now to our main card. So in our first fight on the main card, we have in the women's strawweight division, Marina Rodriguez versus Amanda Rebus. And this is another fight I've already predicted, at least somewhere. So um, Rodriguez versus Rebus, how I see this one is. I think um, Rodriguez is definitely the better striker. A little bit taller, a little bit longer reach. She usually has a, a bigger height advantage, a bigger reach advantage, but it's only like a one inch for each, I believe. So not the same advantage she usually has, but still the better striker. But how to see this one? I think the gap between their um, grappling is far bigger than the gap between their striking. And um, as far as Rodriguez takedown defense and submission defense, well, grappling defense, her takedown defense isn't the best. Like, it's kind of getting to the mediocre tier. Like, I feel like she's working on it. She is a young fighter and definitely improved. But I don't think there's going to be a fight a case where it's going to be that notable improvement or it's going to be enough to get her to victory. I think there's a fight where Rebus is going to be able to fill her on her feet, get her time, get her range, and then start to close that gap. Then mix and takedowns. And from there, I think it's going to be about all she wrote. I just going to take her down, start to uh, pepper her up, and work for submissions. And then I think the first round, she doesn't get it. But I think second round, kind of rinse and repeat. Find her range, set up her takedown, score the takedown, pepper her transition, tap her out. And I think that's in the second round. So in this fight, I have Amanda Rebus via second round submission. Now to our next fight, we have in the lightweight division, Matt Favola versus Otman Isatar. So I'm um, looking at this one right here. Um, I really, really, really wanted to lean to Favola and wanted to see him winning this one because I'm still not that all that high on Otman Isatar. All I see is the guy, he has some striking background, but you know, even though some people have high striker backgrounds, they aren't really the truest of strikers, if it makes sense. Because like, even sometimes we don't have even have really decorative fight backgrounds, like they can really be composed out there, really be natural out there and, you know, be tactical and be smooth and let things just play out. But Isatar, even though all this decorated background, he's got to go out there, he'll throw some feints, then he'll jump in and swing hooks, leave himself open to be hit. And really, he's just getting by by His opponent's been kind of mediocre in the head movement department, the jab department, the footwork department, and a lot of dep- major departments. Because you're not moving your head or you're just holding onto a clinch and you like yourself to get punched in the face. Like, what are you really doing? I feel like a simple... The implement the implication or the implementation of a jab or the the threat of a jab, then using that as a feint or stepping off, any type of thing, any any little small thing could have extended some of these fights along around or potentially gave these opponents of Isatar a chance to beat them. But they simply just don't have some of these very basic tools or and it allows them to go out there and swing sloppily and knock people out. Instead of them like even just covering her up and let him Weather himself out. Just cover up. Move your feet. Cover up. Block some headshots. And when you start going down low, block or clinch up or step off. Do something. But these guys like have very don't have the basics. But enough about that. How see this one right here? I think Favola has a, a well rounded skill set. He has some solid grappling. He has amazing heart. Can push a pace. Got a well rounded fight game. Got some good striking as well. But the reason why I'm not gonna lean to him is he has a higher strike absorbed ratio per minute than strikes put out like strikes landed per minute and in every fight where he has struggled to get takedowns or didn't get takedowns as much as he wanted to he has been knocked down twice in the polo race well the polo race fight he got knocked out before he could even do anything but still in a fight where he didn't get a takedown i don't think he got knocked down twice and knocked out in the fight against um lando venata lando venata has a, some solid wrestling offense and defense and Leonard Venato was able to, you know, get back to his feet whenever he wanted to against um, Favola. And he knocked him down twice. So, And then the fights where he won is fights where he was able to consistently get takedowns. I'm looking at Isatar, even though he, I don't really have the best judge of that, his takedown defense is still at a, 100%. And just looking at him, and I like he got a good hips. And what he, who he trains with, he has good takedown defense. I'm going to assume that a lot with that one. So I'm going to assume he has some good takedown defense. And it's going to hold up to at least 80%, even against decent competition. And on the feet, Favola, I say he gets hit more than he lands. And you're going to get a guy with a very high output, heavy hands, and I don't think Favola's defense is the best, so I feel like this fight going to be on the feet more than it needs to be. Favola's going to get hit more than he should. 
And his defense is not going to be where it needs to be. He's going to get knocked out. And it's probably be a first-round knockout again. So, in this one, I have Ottoman Izatar via first-round TKO. Now to our next fight we have in the women's flyweight division. Jessica I versus Joanne Calderwood. So, I'm um, looking at this one right here. Um, You would think Calderwood was the longer fighter, but she's actually, I think, one inch shorter or the same height. As a matter of fact, they're the same height, but um, I has a one or two inch reach advantage over her. And I is like one to two years younger than her. So really the advantages are lying in I's side. I think Carter was a solid fighter, but her last fight, she really showed her flaws and, you know, what she always kind of showed about her against um, Jennifer Maya. She has good height. I mean, she has good frame and good height. She's a decent striker, but her head movement is beyond mediocre. It kind of stands in the same place at all times. Foot movement, she kind of stiff on the feet. She has a good striking arsenal, but... Not terrible feet and terrible head movement or zero head movement. I think against I, I think I has much better footwork than her. I think I can score takedowns on her if needed. And as far as just grappling and securing, like securing position and securing takedowns, securing control as far as like takedown wise and that sense, she can beat her clinching wise. I think that's all called wood. But I think this fight where I has much better footwork, much better boxing and her head movement is better. She's faster in my opinion. And I think she can um, land strikes on a target that's not moving, which is Calderwood's head. I think she can make some kicks to the leg, move, come in with some flurries, land shots on Calderwood's up top, and do that to a great consistency and beat Calderwood on the decision. And it's going to be an easy fight, no, but I think Calderwood leaves too many open opportunities and in a competitive fight, that's going to lead to I getting a decision. So in this fight, I have Jessica I via decision. Now to our cold prelim headliner, we have in the lightweight division, Dan Hooker versus Michael Chandler. So I looked at, um, followed Michael Chandler, Chandler's career for a pretty long time right here. I think um, I first started watching him after the first Eddie Alvarez fight. So it's been to follow him pretty much ever since like he really came on the scene and became champion in Bellator. And then lost the belt, won the belt, lost the belt, won the belt. And yes, pretty much the most of Chandler's relevant career as far as he, is, I'm concerned. And I've seen enough of his patterns, enough of who he is as a fighter. And I'm saying all this to say this. I'm not going to say he's not an amazing fighter. He is. And I definitely think he could be a good challenge for Khabib, even potentially be Khabib. But at this point, it's hard to pick against Khabib. And I would not really pick anyone against Khabib again. Because, like I said, give Khabib his kudos. but um, And also give Chandler his kudos. But, yeah, so I've I, I seen enough of Chandler to... See why I'm where I'm leaning in this one, and I'm definitely leaning to Dan Hooker in this one. I feel like Chandler kind of said some stuff in the lead up to kind of build himself up and promote himself. Like, oh, I have a good chin, I'm have hard. I did this. I'm a champion. I've been doing this for this and long, but his chin has never been that great, to be honest. You look at um his fight against Will Brooks. His chin in the second fight, his chin definitely didn't hold up. The Eddie Alvarez fight, you could say, kind of held up. I mean, he held up pretty decently in the Eddie Alvarez, but at times he still, when he get hit, he looked lost. And um, and yeah, he does a fighter that, and also the the um, the pit bull fight chin didn't held up at all, or at least durability didn't hold up. But um, yeah, I, I really look at the Will Brooks fight, but that's how it's, how it's going to be more so. They gonna get hit like it start go that Gray Maynard versus Nate Diaz two type of look, or Gray Maynard versus Nate Diaz three because they fought on the Ultimate Fighter, then they fought in pros in the UFC, and then they fought the third time when Maynard was already well past his prime. But um, either way, I think it'll be one of those fights where. Yes, he has solid wrestling. Yes, he can fight for three or five rounds. Amazing fighter, but I just think this is a probably the worst style matchup for him coming into the UFC. You're coming in with a long guy who's like 6'3", and you're um, 5'8". A guy that loves to fight guys shorter than him. A guy with amazing striking. His wrestling definitely nowhere near yours. Not even close, but he's a guy that can... He doesn't need to be a better wrestler. He's a guy that long, dangerous, likes to exploit shorter people, especially shorter wrestlers. Can get up to his feet well and scramble. I mean, like, good takedown defense. And can get up to his feet hard to hold down. And even though you can wrestle five rounds and do all those five rounds, it's hard to do that when you're getting your takedown stuff. They're getting back up right after your takedowns. And then they're picking you apart on the feet. And I like Chandler has amazing striking, amazing power, amazing wrestling. But I just think um, Hooker is a bad matchup for him. And I think, like I said, the takedown is going to be, he going to get them, but, or will at least have a good shot to get them. But, I don't see him doing much with those takedowns. And I just see um, Hooker picking them apart from distance, walking them into his shots, and eventually probably catching him with that knee when he's trying to level change. And even with a lot of stuff that Chandler throws, like those power shots, those long overhands and and stuff, 
All that stuff, I just see him dipping in ranges of hookers kicking. He'll go just been simply out of range for those shots for the most part. And then being able to land that knee on him. I think he puts him away early on in the second round. So in this fight, I have Dan Hooker via second round TKO. Now to our main event, we have in the lightweight division, Dustin Poirier versus the notorious one, Conor McGregor, too. So, um, look at this fight right here. This is a very solid fight, and both men have made lots of improvement. You could definitely argue that Poirier has made more improvements. He went from... But they, then they both... Conor McGregor, when they first fought, wasn't even a champion yet, so... And he became a double champion, so Conor McGregor actually did more in the time since they last fought. But it's, it's, you know, in recent time, Poirier has been doing more, but as far as overall, Conor McGregor has done the more. He actually won a, the official lightweight belt, the official 145 belt. Poirier just won an interim lightweight belt. That's all he did. So, um, yeah, you could um, say he didn't say that, but um, definitely more recent wise, Poirier has been making a lot of, being you know, out there winning and winning more fights at lightweight, whereas Conor McGregor came up there, won the belt, then didn't fight for a while, then came back, lost the belt. Well, in fact, he lost the belt due to inactivity. And then he came back trying to fight for his belt again. And then he lost. So he never officially lost the belt. Is the champion, but you basically lost the belt because you came back and tried to get your belt back against the guy who won it in your absence. And you lost to that guy. Got dominated. Well, didn't get dom- well, dominated at points and then finished. But, um. Yeah, Conor McGregor only has a handful of fights at this weight class. It was Eddie Alvarez. I don't know, like he's been doing these weird matches that be at one Sunday, but that's besides the point. I definitely think you could say is that Poirier, as far as like the last two years or so, two, three maybe years, he's been making more, more problems. But to get to the point of this prediction, I think um, it's just a, st- a fight where I feel like Conor McGregor has his number and has a style that beats Poirier. Yes, Poirier has the overall more well-rounded fighter, but I think wrestling-wise, I think Por- McGregor can actually out Russell Poirier like Poirier I don't even think it would be even questionable or that big of a shocker if they went in a full wrestling match and Conor McGregor just out wrestled him I feel like Conor McGregor is bigger I feel like he's stronger same height longer reach but um yeah Conor McGregor's been the stronger man between the two I feel like he's a better wrestler I feel like his transitions are a little bit better Poirier is better with the submissions but as far as controlling transitions I think Conor McGregor is better in that area far as takedown and takedown defense, McGregor's better in that area. Stats show it too. And um, but yeah, like so if Poirier really tries to mix it up, I don't think he'll have the most sets early trying to throw in takedowns. I think Conor McGregor more so gonna laugh at them early. But like I said, before he can take this late, like how's this fight? If Conor McGregor can get this fight out in the what first two three rounds, he should win. He should win. I mean, yeah, if he obviously finished somebody in the first three rounds, you win. But if Conor McGregor could do that, it's better suited to get this fight out early. But um. Yeah, Poirier is better suited to take this fight long. I mean, he can knock McGregor out. Like he can stop McGregor early, just like McGregor can stop him early. But I feel like he has his better chance if he takes this fight late. And Conor McGregor has his better chance if this fight's done early. And McGregor could possibly do enough in the early rounds and and just win off those three rounds and then get a decision. But I feel like it's gonna be a stoppage. And how I see this fight, let me kind of get my analogy of this one. I feel like Poirier has been making some improvements, especially in his defense. I feel like his chin is better at this weight class without being sucked out. And also, he'll be a better fighter this one mentally, and he's been in some wars, which will help him. But I feel like a lot with his defense improvement, I feel like it turned him into like a his new defense and skills are a chainmail. And Conor McGregor is a piercing blade. So yes, your defense is better, but a piercing striker like McGregor is still gonna find his openings through your guard, which is not like McPoirier's head move has improved so much. He's still he's been hitting been hit a lot still. It's just that. He's able to take it better. But a guy like McGregor, you still can't be. And also, he's been able to roll with some shots. But a lot of these guys have been ha- slashing type of strikers, whereas McGregor is a piercing type striker. So, yes, Poirier will be able to, like I said, endure a little bit better. But McGregor still going to be able to find those openings through his defense, be able to crack him, use his reach. And McGregor is not a guy that has necessarily too much openings on him, whereas Poirier has quite a bit. And I feel like McGregor going to be using his teeth, maintaining that distance, find and pick through um, Poirier's guard. Competitive fight, definitely more than the first fight. Go a little bit longer. But I think McGregor eventually started to pick him apart, find his shots through the openings, and put him away in that second round. So in this fight, I have Conor McGregor via second round TKO. 
And so that concludes my fight predictions for the full card of UFC 257 Poirier versus McGregor 2. And as always, thanks for watching.